uh, continue. I know we have a uh, executive order modification that you all will be taking up on Thursday that uh, aims to address some of the challenges faced by our uh, restaurants. We we work with them, uh, with the chambers, to try and uh, de develop a, a, a a, a process that would give us both uh, the flexibility to allow certain uh, late night uh, alcohol consumption that we had previously limited while also giving us the teeth behind some of the enforcement and some of the requirements to ensure the safety of our residents. And so those, uh, we believe that the proposal identified within the executive order will allow us to do that. Uh, we know that it's important for um, our businesses to be able to, to operate uh, and, and uh, this is an important part of their business model for, for the restaurants. And so uh, we've been trying to make that accommodation and we think we've struck the appropriate balance between the public health concerns and, um, and the economic interests involved. We continue to do the same thing with other industries. Um, I spent, uh, as I tend to have done, I spent a fair bit of time last night, about two and a half hours, researching the, the science of indoor airflow, uh, trying to educate myself further on how ventilation and filtration are increasingly important and how we address COVID-19. Uh, we've already begun work in our county buildings to identify places where we think we need to enhance either filtration or ventilation. Uh, as we get into the winter months where more people are going to be inside, those uh, air exchanges and filtration are going to become an important, more important component of our response to COVID-19 than they were during the summer when more activities could be done outside. And so we're going to look at that. Uh, it also will likely be a part of how we uh, you know, make allowances for additional indoor activities based on the capability and capacity of uh, the facilities to do air exchanges and or filtration, uh, utilizing um, either HEPA filtration or other mechanisms to clean the air of that's indoors. So more to come on that. I know, for example, we heard, we, we saw the release from uh, the only theater. Uh, we know that our, our, our businesses continue to be de devastated by COVID-19 and, and, the, and the restrictions that, you know, we've put in place. Um, this is genuinely a no-win situation for most of us where we're trying to make choices between public health and, and, and economics or, or other issues um, and other interests. And we're trying to do as best as we can to strike the, the best balance. I know that, that the, the hospitality industry has been particularly hard impacted by COVID-19 and has had the most, uh, has had limitations that continue beyond many others. And so I know that this is an area we're going to continue to look at. Uh, we are going to sit down with uh, the movie theater industry. We have a meeting that we're, we're setting up already in place there. Similarly, I think um, uh, the county executive met with the hospitality group yesterday. He, he's asked Dr. Gales and I to sit down with them. Uh, in the coming days and weeks to try and see, hear out their concerns and see if we can find some additional accommodations there. We'll, we're going to keep looking. Uh, we pledge to keep trying to identify options that will make it safe for them. But I, but I just want, wanted to make it clear that uh, it's going to be extremely challenging for us. The other area I want to talk about is uh, the food arena. We continue to see incredible need, even uh, um, uh, through the salute efforts, uh, um, We've heard uh, an increasing demand from, from our community for food. And uh, and unfortunately, we've seen some changes in the way that some of the federal programs have worked that we're actually seeing less support from the federal government in this arena than we have in the past. And as an example of this, the USDA uh, Farm to Food Bank program had previously been providing the county between 23 and 26,000 food boxes a week. They informed us a couple weeks ago and, and took effect last week that they reduced that down to 4,000, three or 4,000 bucks a week. And so this is an area where uh, we're going to become increasingly challenged. We, we still have resources from the previous allocation that the council has made. And so we are not, we're not in dire straits yet, but I think this is an area where we're going to have to make further investments uh, from what we already have, but also uh, potentially other dollars may have to come down the pike because, you know, obviously I think we all agree that food is not an area where we can afford to to cut corners or to skimp, uh, people need to eat. That's a basic basic priority and one that we take very seriously and we'll continue to look at as we move forward. We are going to engage with that congressional delegation to attempt to address the shift in programming. Um, we've been told essentially it's they're shifting priorities around to focusing on other areas of the country. We know that there are real needs here in Montgomery County. We've heard them, we've attempted to respond to them. 
and we are going to do whatever we can uh, to to uh, encourage a return uh, for the federal support. And if we don't see that, we'll obviously have to step in and, and provide the support that our, we know our residents need. Um, so we continue our, we, we had, took a week off uh, last week from meeting with our um, the non-public schools. I know Dr. Gales will provide some additional updates on, on what we've seen in the intervening time. We're going to continue to meet with them on uh, Friday, this Friday and the following Friday. Uh, continue to uh, provide uh, guidance, uh, answer questions with, for them to, um, you know, uh, continue to be able to try and operate during COVID-19. We continue to see uh, cases, and again, Dr. Gales will give them more specific numbers, but we see cases in our non-public schools. We've seen a handful in uh, MCPS uh, workers and others, as well as Montgomery College. And so we've really seen, seen it in all avenues, as we've seen it across all avenues of society. And obviously, this is going to pose a challenge. At the same time, we do continue to work with the Montgomery County Public Schools to try and find some reasonable options that allow for particularly special education and other students to have opportunities in our school buildings. Uh, we know that's important. We know that in-school education is the gold standard and one that we would want to get back to. We just want to make sure that we can do it as safely as possible over the uh, coming uh, months. Related to the restaurant uh, changes that, that my understanding will be an opt-in with requirements, uh, are you at the point where you can Certainly we could do this next week, but could you just give some general outlines? We've all gotten a lot of questions about what will be required and just quickly when, when people will be able to apply and opt in, just the high level, uh, assuming we take action uh, Thursday. Thursday. Sure. And so uh, there are a few requirements. Number one, um, we, we actually took a proposal that was made by a uh, uh, collaboration between the Bethesda Chamber of Commerce and several of our other particularly uh, Latinx uh, restaurants in the Wheaton, Silver Spring area. They put together a proposal of guidelines around just food service, you know, safety, things like general things like that that most restaurants are already doing. What we added to that are, um, so we, we, we would expand from 10 p.m. to midnight and during the 10 p.m. to midnight hour, the, the business who opts in would be required to staff and or hire a contractor whose sole responsibility is enforcement of the the, of the requirements inside the restaurant for that period of time. Um, essentially, what we realized is we can't be everywhere at once in these restaurants, and we needed the restaurants to help us in their own self-enforcement. Um, the other thing it would do is it will allow us, it, well, first of all, it gives us a little more teeth in terms of we can take the permit away should we find people who are not following the rules. And frankly, even to opt into the program, you can't have been a place that's already had violations because we want to reward the people who have been good, uh, safe uh, operators in the past, which is the vast majority of our businesses or restaurants in Montgomery County. So if you've had any violations, not it's not a number. It's just if you had one violation, you couldn't opt in. If you've had a COVID-19 site, not just, oh, not a warning. You okay. had to have a citation issued. Got it. Uh, closure or something else like that. It's a limited number of businesses, but frankly, if you've had a citation issue, that means you've had warnings already before that citation. Um, and then, and then we also have uh, we have some clear metrics that allow for the drawback of the program. I know Dr. Gales was particularly concerned about, well, what if this becomes a source of an increase? Maybe it's not the source, but maybe you know it's one of many things that contributes to an increase. And so we identified some pretty clear metrics. Uh, three-day test positivity that exceeds 3.25%, which we've not seen in a while. A three-day uh, average of cases that exceed 100, which we've not seen in a while. Um, a, you know, a change in our contact tracing data uh, that indicates that indoor dining and outdoor dining are increasingly risky based on what we see on a weekly basis. We have not seen an increase in that recently. Uh, and or a... Uh, it, a large number, 10% or more of the inspected participants having shown violations that would warrant closure. So we saw a lot of violations of the program. We pulled back that program. Great. Uh, the permit will be up. It should be up this afternoon or early tomorrow morning, which will be in advance of your all approval. Uh, it should take, it's not a lengthy program process. It's essentially, we list the rules. You acknowledge that you've read the rules and you're committing to abiding by the rules. You put in the business information. But what that also allows us to do is we know who's opted into the program and we know to whom we need to do further follow-up and enforcement.
as Dr. Steiner pointed out, there are two different categories that are required to be reported to the health department when there are their illnesses. There's co confirmed COVID cases and then there's COVID-like illnesses. And so when those happen, they have to be reported to the health department and subsequent action is taken. And so for example, in the setting of a COVID-like illness, the guidance from the health department is pretty much treating it as if it's COVID until proven otherwise. And so the recommendations in terms of quarantining, uh, potential, um, you know, closure of classes or schools, that kind of thing, that guidance would be provided pending a, a negative test result. And once that test result comes back negative and it's confirmed that it is not indeed COVID, the guidance is given to the schools that they're able to relax those provisions and go back to normal. And so we do track both sets of, of uh, statistics. Uh, since we last had our, our briefing last Tuesday, I counted we've had nine schools report cases in some capacity, students, staff, or teachers that turned out to be non-COVID illnesses. They were COVID-like, but were confirmed negative. We've had 10 schools um, that did report cases that were actually positive cases that involved students, staff, and or teachers. And in those settings, there are two of them uh, that we received in the last 24 hours that we are looking into to determine if there is potential that would meet outbreak status. And outbreak would be more than two cases, either two confirmed cases or one confirmed case and another case that is uh, a, a probable case or suspicious case. So we're looking into that. As you recall, in the past, we did have two instances where we did have that met the definition of outbreak, where we thought it was concerning for potential transmission within that setting. So we do come, we do collect data. Um, I know that I received a question from one of the uh, analysts that was sent by you and, and provided a response this morning. Uh, so we do collect data. We have not made that data public outside of our briefings here. And we've actually asked, we had a conversation with our colleagues at the state level to ask if they would be publicizing that data similar to how it was publicized for nursing homes and so forth. Uh, my understanding is that there will likely not be a state effort to report that information. Um, and I think we can have a conversation offline with our legal team as well to make sure that uh, if that were to happen on a local level, that it would be respective of the necessary uh, privacy provisions.